<laughs> honorably discharged with the rank of first lieutenant. In 1957, he attended Brooklyn Law School and graduated in 1961. Two of his three children were born while he was in law, law school. Judge Nan to notice a pattern of corruption in the investigation and prosecution of the cases by senior members of the office of the district attorney and the elite Suffolk County Police homicide squad. I am tired. I am weak. And I'm warm. Through the storm and through the night. Take my hand. Precious Lord, take my hand, lead me, lead me on home. Though my way may seem dreary, precious Lord, linger near when my life. This old life is almost gone. Hear my cry, Lord, hear my call. Take my hand, precious love. Take my hand, don't let me fall. Precious love, take my hand. First of all, I want to say what an honor it is for me. It's almost overwhelming that I would be invited to address the first annual breakfast of the Martin Luther King Day Affair of the NAACP New Hanover County. This is especially meaningful to me because over my desk at home, I have an award. It's a clock. It's an international clock. And it's an award which was given to me. I was given an honorary life membership in the Long Island region of the NAACP. And on that award, it says, to someone who stood up for what was right at great personal sacrifice. Principle was ahead of expediency, a man who practiced and lived what everyone else preaches. Now, I'm obviously not a person of color, but there are two very important people of color that have meant a lot in my life, that have been very inspirational to me. One of them was Justice Thurgood Marshall, and I'm going to tell you a, a short story about Thurgood Marshall. Uh, I in, was in City College of New York, as Dolores told you, uh, in 1954. I was taking state and local government, and my professor's name was John W. Davis. He was a black man. And of course, in 1954, Brown versus Board of Education was heard by the Supreme Court of the United States. And the lawyer representing the opposition to the people fighting the segregated schools was John A. Davis. John A. Davis was once a candidate for president of the United States. At that time, he was a Wall Street attorney and a very well-known appellate attorney. So it was then that I began to learn about Thurgood Marshall. In 1965, or 66, I uh, became an attorney in the Federal Trade Commission. And our office was in the United States Courthouse in Foley Square. Uh, any of you from New York, you know it's in Manhattan, in lower Manhattan, not far from what's known as Ground Zero today. And uh, I had an associate in my office with me, we were attorneys, all attorneys in the office, a elderly black man who had been active in the NAACP in Washington, D.C. And of course, as you know, President Kennedy appointed Thurgood Marshall to the bench during that period. And he was appointed as a judge of the circuit court of the 10th district, which was in the United States Courthouse in Foley Square. And my associate said to me one day, Stuart, do you want to meet Judge Marshall? I said, man, I sure would like to meet Judge Marshall. I've heard about him. 
as long as I can remember. And he took me down to his chambers, and this was this very big man standing there, and he squeezed my hand and gave me a big handshake, and of course I met Judge Marshall. Little did I know that many years later, I would receive a distinguished award in his name. The second person that has been very inspirational to me, and I believe inspirational to anybody in government or in public life, and of course that's the man whom we honor today. And I didn't understand why I would be asked to speak at a Martin Luther King breakfast, because frankly I'm not an expert on Martin Luther King. And uh, the things that I was involved in didn't involve Martin Luther King, it didn't involve segregation, although it did involve a battle. So there are four quotations that I found from Martin Luther King that I'd like to give to you this morning, because I'm not going to be able to say them the way the, the, the Reverend did, but I'd like you to listen to these and share with you a little bit of my story and how it relates to one of these quotations. The first quotation is, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. The second one, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. The time is always right to do what is right. When we ask Negroes to abide by the law, let us also declare that the white man does not abide by the law in the ghettos. Day in and day out, he violates welfare laws to deprive the poor of their meager allotments. He fragrantly violates building regulations and his police make a mockery of the law. Of course, the four most memorable words of Martin Luther King are these four which he said at Lincoln Memorial, I have a dream. And I find that to be most appropriate to my career as a judge because I too had a dream, but my dream turned into a nightmare. <coughs> and I'm gonna tell you a little bit about that. Dolores told you that I was born in Brooklyn. Of course, Brooklyn's a big place, and I'm sure some of you must have relatives in Brooklyn. Some of you may even have lived in Brooklyn at one time. Brooklyn has wealthy people, and Brooklyn has poor people. I grew up in a neighborhood known as Brownsville. Some of you may have relatives in Brownsville. In the days that I was living in Brownsville, Brownsville was virtually an all-white community. However, there were three streets in which the black people lived, and I even remember the names to this day. I grew up in the tenements of Brooklyn, so I was a poor kid when I grew up. And when I went to college, if there wasn't a place like City College of New York, which incidentally Colin Powell went to as well, and Colin Powell was in my ROTC class, if I did not have a place like City College of New York, which at that time was a no tuition school. I wouldn't be speaking to you today. I probably never would have been a college graduate. So I went to City College, then went into the Army, went to Korea, came back from Korea, went to law school, but I went to law school at night because I couldn't afford to go to law school during the day. And I worked for Equitable Life Assurance Society as an underwriter while I went to law school at night. And as Dolores told you, two of my children were born when I was in law school. I was so poor when I was going to City College, and I was going with my first wife at that time, we became engaged while I was at City College, that a big date for me on Saturday night was living in Brooklyn, we would take the subway, which at that time cost five cents, to 100 Center Street. Some of you may see 100 Center Street on television. That's the big magistrate's court. That's the downtown court in Manhattan. We'd go to night court on a Saturday night. We'd sit there and watch the magistrates at night, then we'd get out, take the subway again to the South Ferry, which also cost a nickel, got on the South Ferry and took the ferry to Staten Island for five cents, but didn't get off because if you got off, you had to pay another five cents. <laughs> we'd stay on the ferry, go back to the train, and go home. So I loved seeing these judges at work, even though they weren't very important judges to me. They were very important because they wore black, black robes. They were very impressive. And I had a dream. I wanted to be a judge. Well, lo and behold, after I worked for the Federal Trade Commission for a few years, I decided that it was too long a trek. I was living in Long Island at that time, and it would take me almost two hours each way to go to work and back, and decided I'd like to go into the private practice of law. So I met a lawyer who was going to practice with a man who became, and was becoming at that time, the county Democratic chairman of Suffolk County. And if those of you don't know it, Suffolk County is east of New York City, 
It's the easternmost county in New York State. It's the place where the rich go. That's where the Hamptons are. I'm sure most of you heard of the Hamptons. Well, uh, this man was going to be the county chairman of the Democratic Party and certainly wanted to work for that firm, so I went to work for them. Now, I still had that dream. I wanted to be a judge. Well, I told my partner that we became partners after a while that I'd like to be a judge one day. But you see, we were Democrats in a Republican county, and there was no chance that a Democrat could get elected in Suffolk County as a judge because it was overwhelmingly Republican, and uh, that was a dream I knew would never come to fruition. Well, one day I got a call from the Judicial Nominating Committee, and they said to me, uh, Stuart, we'd like you to run for District Court of Suffolk County in the town of Brookhaven. Well, I knew I wanted to be a judge, but I knew I couldn't win. But if you want to be a judge, you run. So I ran. And this was a town which was overwhelmingly Republican. I mean, really conservative, overwhelmingly Repu Republican, and I couldn't win. But as luck would have it, we had Watergate. <laughs> As a result of Watergate, I was elected district court judge. And I was elected by 72 votes out of 64,000 votes counted. So I knew that every vote counts. I was challenged in court in three separate lawsuits. And every time they had a recount of the ballot, I'd lose votes. Because it was a sitting Republican judge who was deciding uh, on the recount. So I finally won on December 31st of 1975 by 58 votes. I didn't know until two days before I became a judge whether I was going to be a judge on January 2nd or whether I was going to still be practicing law. Well, my dream came true and I became a judge. And uh, I became a judge in the district court and I thought that I was a damn good judge. And uh, district court isn't an important place. You don't really get to handle felonies, but you do get to hear some hearings. You do get to set bail in, in felony cases. And I thought I was a good judge. After all, this was my dream. And people would say to me, talk to me when I was running about the revolving door system of justice, and I knew what people were saying about justice. So I was a good judge, and I was a tough judge. Well, of course, I had to run for re-election six years later. Now, six years later, Watergate was past history. <laughs> Ronald Reagan was now president of the United States. And here I was, a Democrat, running in the town of Brookhaven, and it wasn't a prayer. I could have run against Mickey Mouse, and Mickey Mouse would have defeated me. So of course I lost, and I lost overwhelmingly because most people, as you know, don't know who a judge is. You know who the mayor is, you know who the council people are, but you don't know who the judges are. You usually vote the party line, or you don't vote at all. So I was overwhelmingly swept out of office, and I was devastated. When I went to my former uh, a partner who was the county leader, I said, Dominic, I don't want to practice law anymore. You've got to get me back on the bench. And he's telling me, well, you know, there's a long line of people who want to be judges. You judges don't do anything for the party. This is a guy who practiced law with for 10 years. <laughs> you judges aren't worth anything. Well, anyway, he thought, I guess, the better of it. And he gave my name to Governor Carey at that time because there was a vacancy in the county court to fill a vacancy. And I was uh, nominated, appointed to fill a vacancy in the county court, but that meant in November I was going to have to run again. This time, though, not in the town, but in the whole county of Suffolk, and I knew I couldn't win. Well, as luck would have it, very much like the North Carolina legislature, the New York legislature, there are two houses, they were split. One was Democrat, and one was majority Republican. And the legislature decided that there were not enough judges in the state of New York that year, and they were going to uh, make additional judges throughout the state. However, they couldn't agree unless they agreed that the, the people who ran would run unopposed. So I was on the bench now, and I was nominated by both the Republican and Democratic parties to the county court of Suffolk County. Again, luck was in my corner. And that was for a 10-year term. Well, as soon as I ascended to that office, and that office was a higher court handling felonies, the major felonies in the county. The administrative judge came to me and said, uh, Judge Nam, I heard about your reputation at district court. We would like you to be one of the three judges who handle homicides in this county. Would you like to do it? I said, yes, I would. I, as a lawyer, I did not handle homicide cases, but I feel I can handle it. So I became a judge handling homicide cases, and virtually my entire calendar consisted of homicides. We had about 60 homicides a year in Suffolk County. It's a busy place. There are over one million people living in that county. 
I was a tough judge. I feel again I was a good judge. I was so tough and I gave people a fair trial. We didn't have the death penalty in New York at that time. Uh, the maximum sentence for a homicide, for murder, was 25 years to life. If somebody got a fair trial in my courtroom and I tried to give them a fair trial, and they were convicted of intentional murder, invariably, unless there were some real mitigating circumstances, I would sentence them to 25 years to life. The maximum. But mind you, this is intentional murder now. And this is felony murder. Murder committed in robberies and, and rapes and things like that. And so I was given a nickname. I was called Hanging Stew. I was called Maximum Stew. And I knew about these nicknames. And the police department loved me. The district attorney's office loved me. I mean, they love a judge who gives out tough sentences. Well, one day I got a case of a young black man. His name was Vincent Waters. And pardon me if I don't use the politically expre uh, correct expression, African Americans. I grew up when we call called people of color, color people, Negroes, so I still have old habits. But, and I noticed your organization, and I know it is, the National Association of Advancement of Colored People, so I'm not so far off base. <laughs> I got this case of Vincent Waters, and uh, he was a 17-year-old uh, a black youth who was charged with attempted murder of a Suffolk County police officer. I want to get into the details of the case. And really, the trial was not important, but what was important was what took place before the trial. Uh, most people charged with murder, especially people who don't have much money, or charged with a serious crime, cannot afford to get an attorney. So where, where somebody is charged with such a serious charge in New York, the judge will appoint an attorney to represent them. Well, I happen to sit next to a Negro lawyer, or an African-American lawyer, Pete Newman, who had law school, and he and I were very good friends. And I appointed Pete Newman to represent this young black man. And as soon as Pete was appointed, he made an application to me. And his application was to challenge the entire jury panel of the county of Suffolk, saying that they excluded black young people. Of course, the district attorney's office was up in arms, and we don't exclude young pe black young people. We had a hearing. During the course of the hearing, we, we went through the statistics, and we found out that in the county of Suffolk, out of every three jury panels, the number of jury in three jury panels would be equivalent to the percentage of black youths between the ages of 18 and 21 in the county. So during the hearing, several defense lawyers took the stand and said, Your Honor, I have never seen it. There's no jury in the hearing. This is a judge handling the hearing. I have never seen a young black person on a jury in Suffolk County. Now, I had already been a judge at that time in the county court for four years. I had never seen a young black person on a jury in any of the cases I handled. Now, on the other side, three assistant district attorneys got up, and each one of them swore that out of every three jury panels, there was at least one young black youth. Each one of them attested to that, and I scratched my head each day and said, how could that be? I've never seen one. Where are they? <laughs> now, mind you, these were assistant district attorneys. Uh, a witness was then called the commission of jurors. And he was asked how they obtain young jurors for the jury panel. Well, lo and behold, his records were brought in, and letters had been sent to all of the high schools in the county, which were predominantly white. Not one letter was sent to Wyandanch, to South Babylon, to any of the high schools where we knew the population would be at least 50% or predominantly black and Hispanic. So at that time, I realized these DAs were lying. And I knew it, of course, when they said it. And I found that young blacks were being excluded from the jury panels in the county of Suffolk. However, I couldn't dismiss the charge because the Supreme Court of the United States has held that youths between the ages of 18 and 21 are not what's known as a recognizable group. And if you're not a recognizable group, then your constitutional rights aren't being violated, 
so my hands were tied. However, there were headlines in the county, judge rules that black, young blacks have been excluded from juries. I called that case my eye opener because here I was, the hanging judge, max, maximum stew, and now I was beginning to see something that opened up my eyes. Then I had another case came to me, People Against Peter Corso. And I'm not going to get into all the details of these cases, but let it simply be said that when I listened to this trial, it became readily apparent to me that the police officers who had taken the stand, and by the way, I have to tell you, the Suffolk County Homicide Squad at that time in the Suffolk County Police Department was the highest paid police department in the United States. They were earning more than the New York City PD. They were earning more than the LAPD. And these detectives on the homicide squad, and I call them the elite homicide squad, they had unlimited overtime. So back in the 70s and early 80s, these detectives were earning over $100,000 a year with their overtime. And I would hear one detective after another in this case get up there and say, by the way, this was a contract murder. It was a gangland type murder. It was the murder of a very prominent Hispanic lawyer in the county. He was shot twice in his eyes and once in his ear. So it was a classic contract murder. And the man who was being charged was a drug dealer from New York City who, by the way, if any of you have ever read or seen the movie Prince of the City, was one of the characters in the movie Prince of the City. And uh, but what was important in that trial was detective after detective would get on the stand and when they were questioned, they would say that during a period of six months, when they were conducting investigations of this homicide, they took no notes. No notes whatsoever. And I also found out that when they began to stop taking notes, they had just interviewed a owner of a funeral parlor in the county who was a member of the uh, city uh, county legislature who told them that a prominent member of one of the mafia families in the county, and Suffolk County had its share of mafia, uh, had threatened this man. And that this man was intruding upon the sanitation business, this lawyer, of these mafia people who control the sanitation business in the county. But once that came out, there were no further notes taken. Well, ultimately, at the end of the trial, <laughs> The jury heard what I heard, and the jury came back after six hours and found the defendant not guilty of murder. And the jurors made statements the next day to the press that we don't understand how a police department or a homicide detective can, can conduct an investigation and not take any notes. We didn't hear enough to convict this man. Then I had another case, a rape murder of a mother in a community known as Port Jefferson Station in Suffolk County. It was a horrible case. A young uh, man, a white man, was picked up who hung out in the railroad yard in, in, at Port Jefferson Station. Uh, his name was uh, James Diaz. And uh, James Diaz, the police say, confessed to the murder. But you know, unlike what you see on television today, when the uh, police of Suffolk County conducted an interview it's known as an interview, not an interrogation. When they conducted an interview, there was no recording made. There was no television camera on. And when a defendant confessed, it wasn't in the defendant's hand. The police officer wrote the confession, and then the defendant was simply asked to initial and sign the confession. And they said that uh, Diaz had confessed to the murder, and by the way, the woman had been stabbed to death, and he told us that he threw the knife in the backyard of the house. Well, they never found, they had dogs sniffing for the knife. They never found the murder weapon. During the course of the preliminary hearings and the trial, the former husband of the victim was playing ping pong with his children in the basement of the house. And underneath, the, a ball went into a pile of logs. And he went into the pile of logs, and there was the murder weapon. Now, the police told me that the defendant said he'd thrown it in the yard. Well, who put it underneath the wood pile? Well, the jury heard what I heard, and James Diaz was acquitted of murder. At that time, I went home and I said to my wife, and my wife was a probation officer in Suffolk County. Probation officer is like a police officer. I said, Lenore, I can't handle this anymore. By the way, this was in the newspaper every day. I would, 
But whereas most people don't know who, know who a judge is, I was in the headlines every day because these stories were headlines in the county. I went home to my wife and said, Lenore, I can't take this anymore. I'm going to ask for a special investigation by Governor Cuomo. Our life is never going to be the same. At the same time, before I sent the letter out, the district attorney of Suffolk County was accusing me of playing politics, that this was all politics, that the, there was a district attorney's race, I was a Democrat, and the man who was running against him had been my campaign manager. Remember I told you, when I became a judge, I didn't even run. I had crossed endorsement. I had no campaign manager. I didn't even know this man. So I, I was now a guy who was playing politics. So I wrote to Governor Cuomo, my wife and I were going on vacation to South America, and I said, and the election was coming up, I asked him for this investigation, I said, please, whatever you do, if you can ask for a special prosecutor, do not do it until the election is over, because I don't want anybody to say that this had anything to do with politics. Well, I came back from South America, of course the Republican district attorney won re-election, I came back from South America and an investigation started. An investigation which lasted for five years. The place, the courtroom that had been my dream became a nightmare. The police who loved me, I was now their enemy because I was the judge who brought a black cloud over the county. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm looking at a police officer standing right there. I'm not talking about all police because most police, yes, yes, most most police do a great job. Most we need stuff. the police to protect us. Most of them do a great job. This was a group of corrupt police officers. Like well, this investigation lasted for five years, and every time a DA would come into my courtroom, he would try to provoke me to say something because they were going to try and get me off the bench. One day, uh, my chamber's door was opened, and standing at the chamber's door was the uh, chief administrative judge of the state of New York. I had never met the man, but I had certainly heard him speak at judicial. I don't want to go too long because I know you got the parade coming. The chief judicial officer of the state of New York. He introduced himself to me and I said, I know who you are. I've heard you speak. He said to me, I'm going to tell you a little parable, Judge. Someday, if you wake up and you're on one side of the street and you see everybody else on the other side of the street, then you know you're on the wrong side of the street. <laughs> and that was his parable. That was the last words I heard from the chief administrative judge. Well, I was then removed from the criminal court uh, because I was very controversial and I was put in the civil part. And uh, I fought back. I had a news conference. The New York Times wrote an editorial. Newsday wrote an editorial. And Newsday was our major newspaper in Long Island saying that I should be put back on the bench. Ultimately, I was put back on the bench. And then, lo and behold, I was now back. I was on the bench, but I was handling civil cases and I was just bored with it. I got back into homicides again. And I got a case of a young black man named Anthony Atkinson charged with a murder, a robbery murder. And uh, the police alleged, or the district attorney alleged, that he had confessed orally to this murder and that he had uh, rolled this elderly Jamaican man who was intoxicated and had taken his money and jewelry. But they didn't know what happened to the jewelry. Well, during the course of the hearing, a lawyer came into my chambers and said to me, Judge, do you know that they found two guys that have the jewelry from that case? I said, no, I didn't know that. And I asked the, the assistant district attorney, I said, did you know that? Well, yeah, I know something about it. I said, well, you got another guy being charged. What's happening with the two guys who got the, the jewelry? Well, well, we, we, don't, we don't know anything about that. We got a confession from this guy, and that's all we know. So I went up to see the district attorney. And the district attorney said to me, we got a confession from this guy, and that's it. Well, you know, the two young men, who, by the way, had a reputation of rolling drunks throughout the county, never were charged with the murder. They were told not to say anything by the police. And I, of course, dismissed the charge against Anthony Atkinson. And to this day, nobody has ever been charged with the murder of that Jamaican man. Well, 10 years had just about come and my term was over. And I thought, by the way, as a judge, you don't get involved in politics. And I certainly didn't. Although some judges pay for the annual dinner, they have their wives come to the annual dinner. I didn't do that. My partner was still the county, former partner was still the county chairman. He also had become the New York State Democratic chairman. And uh, I began to hear rumors. 
you're not going to get renominated, Judge. I said, what are you talking about? I said, man, that guy was my partner for 10 years. I ought to be a hero to the Democratic Party. This was a Republican county. If anybody should hate me, it should be the Republican Party, not my own party. So I started calling my partner. But I didn't hear from my partner. He never answered the telephone. <laughs> then the Judicial Nominating Convention came, and sure enough, I was not renominated. The next day, I called my partner. This time, he answered the phone. I said, Dominic, how could you do this to me? We were like brothers. We practiced law together for 10 years. He said to me, and these are the last words I heard from my former partner. He said, Stuart, this was just not your year. <laughs> well, when I began to hear rumors, we had property in North Carolina. My wife and I decided we ought to start building a house in Hampstead, where we had property since 1980. Um, there were people who came to me at that time and said, Judge, we'd like you to run for district attorney because there was going to be another district attorney's race the next year. I went home and talked to my wife and my three children, and they said to me, my kid said, Daddy, if you stay in this county, they're going to kill you. <laughs> so we moved to North Carolina. And I'm not sorry because... <laughs> I visit Brooklyn every so often. In fact, my wife Nancy, who I married after my first wife died, uh, comes, her mother comes from Brooklyn. I took her back to Brooklyn to show her where her mother met her father in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we moved to North Carolina, and about three weeks after I, the move to North Carolina, I get a call from New York State uh, from an attorney on the New York State Bar Association. He says, Judge, we want to bring you back to New York to give you what's an award known as the David S. Michaels Award. I didn't even know these people even knew I existed, because, you know, Suffolk County is out there 75 miles from New York City, and these are all big hotshot lawyers in New York City, and I'm just judge out in the rural county or suburban county. So I said, fine. He said, we're going to put you up at the uh, Marriott Marquis Hotel. I said, fine. I got the date. And he said, we're going to pay for your airfare and you and your wife and put your room in the hotel. Then I get a call from the New York State Association of Criminal Defense Lawyers. And they say, Judge, uh, on that same weekend, we want to give you an award known as the, David, uh, the uh, Thurgood Marshall Award. I said, my God, Thurgood Marshall. He said, we want you to know the only other person who's gotten this award before you was Thurgood Marshall himself. <laughs> and I said, well, I appreciate it. It was great. I don't, again, I had no idea these people knew I even existed. And then when the NAACP heard about this, and of course they, the NAACP and I had had a long relationship in the county, they decided to give me that award as well. But you know, uh, I got interviewed by Newsday. I was a pretty controversial guy, I, I guess you can realize now. So when Newsday heard that I was getting these awards, they, they called me and said to me, uh, Judge, do you feel vindicated? Because they wrote a big column about the awards. I said, no, I don't feel vindicated. I said, what I did was right. And I, I, they said, would you do it again? I said, look, I didn't intend for this to happen. It happened. And if it happened again, I'd have to do it again. Man. But you know, the guys who turned the other way, the guys who sweep the stuff under the rug, they're still in office in Suffolk County. One of my friends, a good friend of mine, the judge came up to me one day and said, Stuart, do you know what you're doing? Nobody wins in this situation. The commission asked me to talk to any judge that might be willing to talk to them. I went to see my closest friend, who was a, doing the same work as me, who was a Democrat and was very liberal. I said, Harry, these people need to talk to somebody else. Will you talk to them? His answer to me was, Stuart, I just can't get involved. I got to run for re-election next year. So that's the end of my story. But it really isn't an end because life got a lot better here in, in North Carolina than it was in New York State. Uh, I was out in Hollywood. I got to work in television. I got to do a lot of exciting things. But again, I don't know how what I did relates to Martin Luther King. But I know what I did was right. And I know that when I wake up in the morning, and when I put a razor to my face, I can look myself in the mirror. I just wonder how some of my former friends can look themselves in the mirror. I'm going to tell you one short story and I'm going to leave. And this is a, this is a good one. Six years ago, I took my wife Nancy, we went to see Bring In The Noise, Bring In The Funk. 
on Broadway, <laughs> Sabian Grubber. I always loved to dance. I said to Nancy, you know what? I can do that. I mean, I never took a dance lesson, a tap dance lesson in my life. I went home and I said, I'm going to take tap dancing lessons. I went to the senior center because I'm that old. And I got into a class with a bunch of ladies and I couldn't keep up with them. I knew I could dance, but we have a word in Yiddish, it's called a klutz. I was like a klutz. I, I just couldn't dance like that. So I went home and I said to Nancy, we're going to put a dance floor in the house. We cut out some carpeting in our downstairs. We put in a wooden dance floor. And I started to choreograph and teach myself tap dancing. I've been tap dancing now for six years. And I got to tell you, I just celebrated my 70th birthday. But I got to tell you something else. I tap dance in senior games. I've won two state gold medals in dance in senior games. They're all dancing against professionals. Well, one day I was dancing up in Raleigh, and I did one of my routines, and it was a routine from bringing the noise, bringing the funk, and I got off the stage, and backstage, there was two black ladies. And one black lady looked at me and she said, man, where did you get that rhythm? <laughs> and I leaned over to her and I whispered, and this is a true story, I whispered in her ear, I said, I've got some black blood in me. <laughs> and she turned oh, to her friend and she said, I told you so. I 